بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا وبعد We'll continue inshallah ta'ala in our series of a sitting with the Sahaba the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam radiyallahu anhum and tonight as we mentioned last week we're on an, a mu'id on an appointment with a sitting with Umm al-Mu'mineen the mother of the believers Aisha radiyallahu anha who Obviously, as we're going to see, many lessons and many benefits that we can gain from her story to inspire us to follow, as we said, in the footsteps of the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. SubhanAllah, when we, look, we talk about the Sahaba of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we're talking about a group of people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about them in the Qur'an, radiyallahu anhum, that Allah is pleased with them. And when you're talking about a group that Allah is pleased with. And we look into their seerah, into their stories. We need to look at what are the characteristics, what are the characteristics of these individuals that made them special, that made them so unique that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was pleased with them. And when you look at the story of Aisha in particular, radiallahu anha, here is someone that was the most beloved to our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And someone that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala loved and was pleased with and sent down ayat, verses from the Quran and her defense. Ayat that we read in the Quran, inshallah ta'ala, until Yawm Al-Qiyamah. This shows us the status of Aisha radiallahu anha. And Aisha, when you look at her status or her fadail, her virtues, You will see that if we want to talk about them, we would talk for the entire evening. We could speak about just the virtues of Aisha radiallahu anha. But we're going to mention three hadith. All of these hadiths are in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, which shows us her status and some of her virtues radiallahu anha. And throughout the lecture as well, you're going to see some of the things that show you her status and her virtue radiallahu anha. The first hadith, the hadith of Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu an, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that many men reach perfection. Kamala min al-rijal kathir. That many men have reached perfection. But from the women, the only ones to reach perfection were Maryam bint Imran and Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun. These are the only women who reach perfection. And then he said, wa fadlu Aisha ala nisa ka fadli and he said, and the superiority of Aisha to the rest of the women is like the superiority of the three to the rest of the foods. And the three, those of you living here in Qatar, you know, in Ramadan, you know what the three is. And the three, obviously, that was back in the day, the, the most eloquent or most any superior food to them. And the Prophet used to love it. And that's why he gave the example to her superiority to the rest of women, to that food that was well known to the people. And another hadith, he said to her, Ya Aish. And this is a way it shows you that he would call her Aish, he would call her Humayra, like different nicknames. And that shows the type of love and affection that he had towards her, radiallahu anha. He said, this is Jibreel who's here with us in the room, who gives you his salams. A Jibreel who was sent down from above the heavens from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring the wahi, the revelation. He's coming in the house and he's giving his salams to Aisha radiallahu anha. So she said to him, and, to, and, and upon him as salam and upon him is peace. This also shows us the virtues of Aisha radiallahu anha. Another hadith which shows the love of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for Aisha radiallahu anha. Amr ibn al-As, he said, when I was sent out to the battle of that is Salasil. He said, I asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Man Ahabba Nas ilayk. Who's the most beloved people to you? And right away, without any hesitation, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Aisha. Right away. The most beloved people to you, Ya Rasulullah. He said, Aisha radiallahu anha. And then he said, Women are rijal. And from the men, who do you love most from the men? He said, Abuha, her father, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anha. And then he mentioned other men after that whom he loves, alayhi salatu was salam. So this shows us obviously these three hadith, the status of Aisha radiallahu anha. When we look into her story, many times we look at the fact that she was married to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam at a young age. And she, so basically a lot of her upbringing 
was in the house of the Prophet Sallallahu in Medina and that had a huge impact on her and who she was and no doubt that's correct but we tend to forget the origin where did it all start it started in the house of her parents and she said radiallahu anha she said I, I don't remember except for that my parents were practicing the deen the first way as she started to recognize as she started to get a bit older she said what I know from my parents is they were practicing their deen and pay attention to this my dear brothers and sisters the impact that parents have upon their children so she said what I remember from this life from this dunya what I saw what I remember when I was young is my parents practicing the deen and she said every day or so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would come to our house in the morning time or in the, or in the evening times uh, uh, during the, the time of Dhur or the time of e uh, the evenings he would come to our house so he would constantly come to their house during these times uh, in the morning times and evening times as I said he would come to their house and he would sit with them so she would also would see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and she would learn from him and then she said that her father decided to open a masjid in the courtyard of their house where he would pray and he would read the Quran and the mushrikeen the men and the, the, the women and the children from the mushrikeen from the polytheists of Mecca they would come and they would watch Abu Bakr radiallahu an watch, watch him pray and watch him reciting the Quran and as we know from his biography radiallahu an from his seerah that Abu Bakr he would break down into tears and he would cry very heavily when reciting the Quran therefore they were wondering what's wrong with him what is having this impact from this prayer and from this recitation of the Quran and it would have a huge impact on the people watching him therefore Kathir uh, a lot of the mushrikeen they became very scared that he would have an impact he would affect their their women and their children by making them want to accept Islam as well therefore they started to forbid them from coming and watching Abu Bakr radiallahu an. so we see the impact that this had on her from a very young age the impact that it had on her from a very young age and then obviously being in the household of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is what completed who Aisha radiallahu anha was and we see that this impact of her upbringing from a young age in the house of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anha in Mecca it prepared her to serve the deen from a very young age at the time of the Hijrah when you look into the story of the Hijrah of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam some of the ones who played the key role were the daughters of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu radiallahu anhu and radiallahu anhuma Asma and Aisha radiallahu anhuma both of them had a role in preparing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and preparing Abu Bakr as-Siddiq for the Hijrah and also at the time in Medina the beginning at the time of the Battle of Uhud it was narrated that uh, Aisha radiallahu anha was from those who were out on the battlefield bringing water to the Mujahideen as they were fighting on the battlefield she would bring to them the water and to serve them so even here you see she's serving the religion from a very young age and this is an inspiration and a reminder for all of us of the capabilities first of all that children have even when they're young and they have the ability to serve the deen and to be successful even from a very young age a lot of times we put things off and we say when they get older they'll do this and this for the ummah at a very young age it's in throughout history you'll see this where the youngsters they're the ones who stepped up the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in the story of zaid ibn thabit and perhaps we'll have a sitting with him in the future as well radiallahu an when it came when they his family and his tribesmen the tribesmen they brought him to the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam to kind of you know show that they were proud that they had a youngster from amongst them who had memorized so much of the quran and he was very good in his recitation of the Quran as well so that made them very proud so they brought he, they brought him to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a young man young teenager or what, what have you and he saw the Prophet Sallallahu right away the ability that this young man had did he say like we say now mashallah mashallah in the future he's going to be able to do this in the future he's going to have a good future in the future he can do this for the deen in the future he can help Islam and the Muslims right away when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw his potential he said I want you to learn the language of the Jews he said because I can't trust them when it comes to what they have written subhanAllah and he said within 15 days he had learned uh, learned, the, the, learned their, their language he, and this was at a young age he became the official translator for the first Muslim country established and he was just 
And he, as we say, a, a young boy today, subhanAllah, radiallahu anhu. So we see the potential that they had, and we're going to see Aisha, radiallahu anha, what she's going to become at a very young age as well, radiallahu ta'ala anha. When you look into the story of Aisha, radiallahu anha, and the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we see in reality a true love story. The Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to feed her with his own hand. And he would drink from the same spot that she used to drink from. When she would drink from, from the vessel, he would see where she drank from. Where she drank from. So the, the place that her lips touched on the vessel, he would drink from the same place, alayhi salatu wasalam. And he would stay awake late into the evening listening to her as she would talk about certain things out of respect for his wife. They used to race and have fun with one another. They would race one another. And this shows you the beautiful in the love and compassion that they had for one another. One time when the Habasha, when those came from Ethiopia, they came to the masjid and they were showing off their wrestling skills and some of their traditional uh, things that they had with the spears and what have you. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he asked Aisha radiallahu anha, do you want to watch them? Do you want to look at them? And he opened up a way for her in the house for her to look out from the masjid and look into the masjid as they were performing their traditional uh, uh, rituals with their spears. And he said, uh, she said that I came next to him and I put my chin onto his shoulder and I placed my cheek onto his cheek. And she stayed watching like this. And then the Prophet Sallallahu he said to her, Hasbuk, it's enough, you've watched enough. And she said, don't be in a hurry. So he gave her some more time. And then a little bit later, he said to her, Hasbuk, it's enough. And she said, don't be in a hurry. And then she says, he said, Wallahi, it's not because I really want to watch them. But I wanted to take advantage of this time being close to the Prophet, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And she said, I want the people to know the status of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to me and my status to him. That she had this stand standing with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, taking advantage of that time, uh, anha, and Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And look at the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Where did he die? Huh? leaning against the chest of Aisha radiallahu anha. And if you look at the hadith, subhanAllah, when he saw the brother of Aisha radiallahu anha, Abd rahman when he came in with the miswak, the Prophet used to like the miswak, he saw him, him chewing, uh, doing the miswak, and, and she took the miswak from the Prophet وسلم, and she broke off the piece that her brother was chewing from, and then she started to chew it herself to get it uh, moist for the Prophet وسلم, get it prepared for the brushing. And then she gave it to the Prophet to help him brush his teeth alayhi salatu wasalam. So she said that his last day in the dunya, it's from the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, she said that the last, his last day in the dunya and his first day in the hereafter, she said, my saliva mixed with his saliva. And he died on the chest of Aisha radiallahu anha. So we see this love and this compassion that they had for one another. But one of the amazing things in their story as well is not just, not just this love and this compassion that they had for one another, but it was a real life story even how they dealt with one another in the household and how they differed because any husband any wife they're going to differ there's no perfect marriage where the man is 100 percent makes no mistakes and there's no 100 percent marriage where the, the 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 woman doesn't make mistakes people are going to differ they're going to have differences of opinion they become angry at one another so how were they when it came to being in the house with one another aisha radiallahu anha abbasi she did her part as the wife but even with that, when she was asked, how was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his household? What did he used to do? She said, kana fi khidmati ahlihi. That he was in the service of his wives. He was helping out around the house. Because if the, any household is going to be successful, there has to be teamwork. The people have to work together. The husband and wife, they have to work together. So this was the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his household. And then when they differed, if you look at how they differed and when they differed, first of all, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Hadith of Sahih Bukhari, he told her, he said, I know that when you're angry with me and I know when you're pleased with me. I know when you're angry with me and I know when you're pleased with me. She said, how is that? She said, when you're pleased with me, you say, you swear by Rabb Muhammad. She said, I swear by the Lord of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She said, if you're angry with me, you swear by the Rabb of Ibrahim, the Lord of Ibrahim. And she said, yes, this is true. She said, I don't leave except for your name. And when I become angry with you, the only thing I leave is your name. But the love in this, it's still in the heart, alhamdulillah. Even one time, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he came to the house of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
And he heard her raising her, vo her voice. And he went into the household and he became very angry and he started to raise her voice to her. And he said, you dare raise your voice to the prophet. The same one, now pay attention to this, who came in her defense? Who came to defend her? The same one who she was raising her voice against. Imagine now, where the household, our wife's raising her voice and her father comes in and says, I dare you raise your voice against your husband. We say, Alhamdulillah, Allah saved us, you know. Now you learn your lesson. Now you get what you deserve. Huh? Who came in her defense? The Prophet ﷺ. He stepped in to defend her. Anha. Abu Bakr anha, he left. Some time later he came back. And when he stood outside of the door, then he heard them laughing. The, the, the voice was raised before and now they're laughing and they got back together. And this is the way the husband and wife need to be. Even if you differ, even if one raises the voice to the other, that we need to reconcile and come back together as quick as possible. So as we learn from this story, that even if we're differing, that we reconcile and we come back together soon after that, inshallah ta'ala. Even when it came to her jealousy, she was one of the most jealous wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In fact, one time in one of the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent uh, some food to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during the day of Aisha radiallahu anha. She was preparing the food. Maybe she was a bit late in putting it in this, so she was getting it ready. And the food came from the other house. She had in her hand a rock, you know, like a rock that they used to prepare some of the food, maybe they used to beat it or grind it or something like that. So they would use those type of things back in the day. So she had this in her hand. When she saw the food from the other wife in front of the Prophet وسلم, she threw the rock at the food. And it broke the plate in half, and the food flew throughout the room. Now imagine if your wife came and threw a rock and broke something and broke the plate and the food f flew around the house. What would your reply be, be to her? What would your stance be? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Gharat ummukum, gharat ummukum, that your mother has become jealous, she's become jealous. And he started to gather the food himself, Alayhi Salatu Wasallam, started to clean up the plate. And started to clean up the area. He realized, Alayhi Salatu Wasallam, that this is something, it's a, it's a nature. And if someone has more than one wife, obviously, there's going to be jealousy, there's going to be this, and this man has to be able to deal with these type of things. So he knew this, and he was patient with her, alayhi salatu wasalam. So this, in many lessons, when you look into their life, it wasn't just this imaginary love story. It was a love story, no doubt. But there was reality in it, where, they, where, where maybe she would become angry sometimes, she would become jealous, and how they dealt with one another in the household. All of these are lessons that we need to take, and this is one of the most important things that we take from the life of Aisha radiallahu anha. Because she was... The one with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. She was the one who narrated to us what happened behind the doors. We, the, the other Sahaba saw how he was outside, but who could see what he was doing behind the doors of his household was Aisha radiallahu anha and the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam who related us these these hadith. When we look into her characteristics and what made her so unique, she was very known for her zuhud, meaning not being attached to this life and not having love for this dunya, and her love for giving and giving sadaqah. In one story, Muawiyah radiallahu an, when he was the Khalifa, he sent her a uh, hundred thousand, a huge amount of money, you know, and imagine that. So a hundred thousand, and she started to what? Take it and to put it in different pouches and started to spread it out in sadaqah. And her servant is saying, Barira radiallahu anha, she's saying that she was fasting. She's very known for her fasting as well, radiallahu anha. When it came time for her to break her fast, she had already given out all of the money. When it came time for Mokrib, she didn't have anything to eat in the house. So Bayrida said, if she had left just a little bit, so we could have bought some meat for you to break your fast on. And she said, if you reminded me, I would have, I would have, uh, I would have bought something. But she didn't, you didn't remind me, so I forgot. So subhanAllah, you see that all this money that came to her, she passed it all out within one day. And where does she learn this from? From the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who used to, when the money would come to him, he'd pass it out immediately. Make sure he gave it out to the people who were in need and for the causes in the path of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to make sure that this money, this sadaqah and the zakat and what he had, the Alayhi Salatu Wasallam, was benefited from, from the ummah. Also, when you look into her worship, she was very known for her fast. And as Imam al Dhahabi, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, mentioned, that Abdul Rahman al Qasim uh, mentioned uh, from his father, that Aisha radiallahu anhu, where she would fast for the entire year. Meaning, the most of the day, the majority of the year, uh, except for the days you're not allowed to fast, and Eid, and, 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 and what have you. So here, she would fast for the majority of the year. Also, she learned this from who? 
from the Prophet ﷺ. He said, sometimes he would fast for so long that you would think he would fast for the entire year. Uh, uh, and, and obviously, other times he would break his fast for uh, long periods of time, and sometimes he would just fast certain days. But he was well known for fasting a lot, alayhi salatu wasalam. Therefore, she took this from the Prophet wasalam, and she was known for her fast and for her worship. She was known for her modesty. After the time, or after the death of Umar al-Khattab, he was buried where? In her room or in her house. After the death of the Prophet wasalam, Abu Bakr was buried next, next to the Prophet wasalam, And then Omar was buried next to Abu Bakr, all of them, in a row. She said that after the death of the Prophet wasalam, in my room, I would disrobe, I would take off my clothes normal. And after the death of my father, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq as well, I would take off my clothes as well. But after the death of Umar, he was buried in my room, she said I was ashamed to take off my clothes in the same room that Umar was buried in. SubhanAllah. Even though obviously he's dead, he can't see, but just it shows you the level of modesty that the Sahabiyat had. When the eye of hijab was revealed, they said they immediately took any garment they could find, they completely covered themselves from head to toe. This was the Sahabiyat. They didn't say like the sisters nowadays, uh, I'll wear the hijab when I'm ready. In the future, I'll start to wear a better hijab. In the future, I'll become more pious. Right away, the ayah came down. There was implementation. SubhanAllah. And this is the reminder for the sisters and even for the brothers of the responsibility that we have towards our sisters, towards our daughters, that we realize the hijab is ibadah. The hijab is ibadah. And if a true Muslim woman, she wears a true hijab, I have a way of ibadah, submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what it means to be a Muslimah. Uh, the one who surrenders to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you look at her knowledge, radiallahu anha, and perhaps this is one of the most things she was known and she was famous for. Ata ibn Abi Rabah, the great tabi'i, from the followers of the Sahaba, rahimahullah and radiallahu an, he said that she was afqah al-nas wa ahsan al-nas ra'yan. That she had the most fiqh, the most understanding from the people, and she had the best opinions as well. She had the most knowledge, meaning the most, the most fiqh and understanding of the religion, and she had the best opinion. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, the great Sahabi, radiallahu an, he said that any time the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam had any problem when it came to a hadith about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he said we would go to Aisha radiallahu anha and we would find the knowledge that we wanted. We differed. We didn't know who, 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 would, the, who would they go to. Looking for the, for the scholar, they, they go to Aisha radiallahu anha. And they ask her about the hadith, and they find the answer that they're looking for. Urwa ibn Zubair, who is her, her nephew, he said, I haven't seen anyone more knowledgeable when it came to halal and haram, when it came to shi'r, poetry, and when it came to tib, the medicine. And as we mentioned last week, we said she was known, obviously, for her knowledge of the halal and haram. She's known for knowledge of hadith, of fiqh. But she was also known for her knowledge of the Arabic language and poetry, even when it came to medicine or traditional medicine, the medicine they had at that time. She was also very known for her knowledge in that. And people would come back to her and ask her about all of these different fields. So they wouldn't just come and ask her about hadith. They wouldn't come and just ask her about fiqh. They would also come to her for fatwas in Arabic language and poetry and ask her these things. And they would come to her about medicine and ask her questions in medicine as well. anha. When it came to her contribution of hadith, more almost I mean some mentioned 299 so about 300 from the Sahaba themselves and from the Tabi'een the followers of the Sahaba they narrated and took hadith from Aisha radiallahu anha she narrated more than 2200 hadiths the ones that we have in the books that we have today about 2200 or 2210 hadith as the scholars mentioned that she narrated radiallahu anha and she is one of the most seven known Sahaba to narrate the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And you get who are the famous seven? She's one of the seven, radiyallahu taala anha, known for narrating the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It's very important when you look at the knowledge that she gained that we ask ourselves, what were the keys that she used to gain this knowledge? How did she obtain it? Because similar, we talked about Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, anhu last week. He had a special dua that was made for him. But he didn't just rely on this, as we mentioned. 
Aisha radiallahu anha, she had something special and something unique that other people didn't have. She was the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She spent so much time with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so much private time. So she had the opportunity to learn more than others. But she didn't just take that. If we wanted to add to that, that's one of the key elements, no doubt. But in addition to that, we're going to mention six things, six keys that helped her obtain that knowledge, other than being with the Prophet وسلم, and spending that private time with him. That's obviously the key element in itself. After that, the fact that she was clever, she was very smart, and she had a very strong memorization, radiallahu anha. When it comes to strong memory, if you really want to obtain knowledge, you have to have a strong memory. Some people say, my memory is weak. What do you need to do if you want to strengthen your memory? Many things that you can do. But obviously, one of the key things is that you leave the ma'asi. You leave the sins. This is one of the main things that come between you and becoming you, you and memorizing, have a strong memory. After that, you have to train yourself and, and continue to do it. One of the scholars said, I had so much difficulty memorizing, I couldn't memorize anything. And then he said that once I trained myself and got used to it, he said, I memorized, and he mentioned a, a book of poetry, which is 200 verses. He said, I memorized it in one night. In the past, maybe he couldn't memorize one or two verses in one day. Then in one night, he memorized 200 verses like that because he had trained himself to doing it. Obviously, we have the issues of the phones and other things that come between us and memorizing. Wallah al-Mustad. I was telling some brothers back in the day, before the cell phones, and they memorize everything for you. How many phone numbers did we used to memorize? And the older brothers, maybe in, the, in their late 30s, early 40s, will tell you. Uh, maybe you know like 40, 50 numbers you memorize. Now, if you ask yourself, some, some brothers, even their own number, they have to, let me check, you know. Maybe we just our wife's number, we have to memorize that. Huh? Other than that, we don't, we don't know any other numbers. This is the, it shows the level of our memorization where we've reached for Allah Mustad. Also, her strength in the Arabic language was one of the main things that assisted her, radiallahu anha. And after, you know, the, we said the fact that she was the wife of the Prophet, وسلم, she learned directly from the Prophet, وسلم, but her implementation, she acted upon the knowledge. And if we want to gain knowledge, we want to benefit from knowledge, one of the key ways to really obtain and have strong and proper knowledge is to implement and act upon that which we've learned. Also, the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, would focus on teaching her. When he found her abilities and her strengths, he focused on teaching her because he realized what? She was going to relay this to the ummah after him, alayhi salatu wasalam. So he focused on teaching her. And also from her virtues, from the virtues that she had, radiallahu anha, is that the wahi, the revelation, never came down to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and any in, in the house of any of his wives except for the house of Aisha radiallahu anha. The revelation never came down to the Prophet sallallahu and the house, unless you mention Khadija, I mean after that in Medina, it never came down and in any of the houses of the wives of the Prophet except for the house of Aisha radiallahu anha. And the last thing we'll mention obviously her, that she was very keen and she focused on learning herself. She wanted to learn. And anybody who wants for something, they have to strive for it. And like this, all of the Sahaba, we mentioned this in the story of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma last week. If we go, inshallah, we mentioned the story of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, how he used to go and, and he, like he was having a seizure from the hunger. He left food so he could learn from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So somebody really wants to strive for something, you have to, you have to work hard for it. And this is what we gain from Aisha radiallahu anha. Also constantly asking the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa how many hadiths we have the understanding of it, whether it be an ayah or a situation in fiqh or the, she asked right away if she didn't understand she would ask and one of the problems we have we're too shy we don't ask and you have the, the, the people in front of you can ask and benefit from them and you don't ask so constantly asking is one of the great ways to obtain knowledge and we see that one of the things that she did as well she shared her knowledge with others she passed it on that's why some of the main scholars from the from the tabi'in they were from her students the like of Arwa ibn, Arwa ibn Zubair her nephew and Al Qasib ibn Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr, Al Masruq ibn Ajda, and Amra, the daughter of Abd Rahman al Ansariya, all of these great scholars of Islam, they were from the students of Aisha radiallahu anha. Also, when you look at what people have obtained in their knowledge and how they reached a certain level, there's always two things to pay attention to, Yaqwan. Any of the scholars you see who are very successful, there's always going to be two things, two things that made them reach this level. 
And as people want to benefit from them, we need to look and try to, to pry in a bit to see what did they do. One of them is a special effort that they made. Hard work, dedication, something they did. We remember one of the scholars in the West, some brothers asked him, he, they saw he was very, his, his knowledge was, was very sound. They said, Sheikh, what did you do to reach this level of knowledge? He said, I made a commitment to myself when I was a young man that I wouldn't let a day pass unless I read 50 pages. This is the minimum commitment. It's not very difficult, especially if you put down your smartphone, to read 50 pages a day. Uh, if the smartphone, you read five pages, you're, you're, much, you're, you're a champion, mashallah. Huh? But if any, 50 pages a day, it's not that difficult. But imagine the knowledge you're going to acquire in a month, in a year, in five years, in 10 years. This consistency is what helped him obtain that knowledge. But there's something else, something hidden. And pay attention to this. Anyone who is successful, there's always something that he has that's hidden. Something that's between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe it's his night prayer. Maybe it's some sadaqah. Maybe it's some orphans he's sponsoring. Something he's doing between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the hadith of Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhuma, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned, you're going to see a man who's going to enter from Jannah now. When they looked into his actions, they want to know what did he do to be from the people of Jannah. Right away, the same thing I told you, when you see their success, what made him from the people of Jannah? So they start to look into his actions. What's he doing? They made him from the people of Jannah. So we didn't find anything special in his, his ibadah, in his recitation of the Quran, and his, in his salat, and his fasting. When they asked him at the end, said, what is it? What is it that you have? What are you doing? He said, I, I can't think of anything unique or special except that I don't sleep at night and I have anything in my heart against the Muslims. He has a clean heart towards his brothers. And that's inshallah ta'ala what made him reach to be from the people of Jannah. May Allah make us all from the people of Jannah, ya Rabbil Alameen. Three things that made the knowledge of Aisha radiallahu anha so unique. Maybe, any, obviously, the fact that she worked hard, that's one aspect. The fact that she, was, uh, that, that she was very pious in herself, and the fact she used to work so hard to, to, to spread the knowledge. These, these things put barakah in her knowledge, blessing in her knowledge, no doubt. But there were some other things as well we're going to mention that put barakah and blessing in her knowledge that carried on throughout the years. And that is, first of all, that she would link her knowledge directly to the Quran and to the Sunnah. One time, they came to her, and they told her that Ibn Abbas had mentioned something that the one who sends a sacrificial animal, the, the, the Hadi, to be slaughtered in Mecca, even if he's not going for Hajj. So if we're here and someone's going in their car and we send with them the, the Hadi to slaughter in Mecca, that Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhuma, he said that the same rulings of the one who's in the state of Ihram, the one who has his Ihram on, he's going to make his Hajj, the same ruling applies to that person who was not even going for Hajj, because why he sent the Hadi. This is what he said. Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, it's not correct, what Ibn Abbas said. And she said, because I helped prepare the sacrificial animal of the Prophet and I sent it with my father. When he went for Hajj the year before, Abu Bakr radiallahu anha, she said, I sent it with my father, and she said, nothing was haram upon the Prophet it's haram upon the, the one going for Hajj. She immediately connected to what she was saying to the evidence that I was with the Prophet ﷺ. He lived a normal life. He, nothing was forbidden for him as he was in Medina, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Therefore, she directed her, her her knowledge directly to the Quran and to the Sunnah, and this is what makes the da'wah and the methodology of Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah, those who truly adhere to the Quran and to the Sunnah, and the way and the understanding of the Sahaba, it makes their knowledge so unique. It makes their knowledge the one that stays and benefits the ummah. It's not about a super sheikh who flies through the air with a red cape. And you'll find in some countries the people have this. My sheikh told me this and he can leap a tall building in a single bound. And, and, this, and, and, and people have this type of belief. And then you'll find that there's no barakah, there's no true blessings in this. It's just kalam. But the true blessings is in adhering to the Quran and the Sunnah and the way of the Sahaba. That's what stays and that's what benefits the people. That's the true knowledge that stays and what benefits the people. You see that Aisha radiallahu anha, if she didn't have knowledge about something, she wouldn't speak about it. Or if she felt someone else had more knowledge than her, she would send that person to them. It wasn't when the person reaches the knowledge, they have knowledge and somebody comes to me and I'm super sheikh, super mufti, as, as some people say today. If we don't know, we say Allahu alam, Allah alone is best. I don't know. 
Huh? When someone came to her, his name was Shurayh ibn Hani, he said, I came to Aisha radiallahu anha and asked her about wiping upon the khuf, on the leather sock, if we're traveling. And she said, go to Ibn Abi Talib, Ali radiallahu anha, because he used to travel with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he knows better. So she sent him someone who has more knowledge about this, even though she traveled with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but Ali radiallahu anha was always with him at the time of travel. Therefore, ask him about this ruling because he's going to have more knowledge than me. Also, you see at the manners of differencing, uh, the manners of uh, differing, when she differed one time with uh, something that the, uh, Abdullah ibn Umar, radiallahu anhu, that he had said, that the Prophet sallam, had made hajj during the month of Rajab. Her nephew, Arwa, Arwa ibn Zubair, came to her and said, did you hear what Ibn Umar said? He said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he made... Uh, Umrah, that he made Umrah during the month of Rajab. And she said, May Allah forgive Abu Abdurrahman, the kunya of Ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma. Say, May Allah forgive Abu Abdurrahman. She said, The Prophet وسلم, never made Umrah during the month of Rajab. And the one who was telling you, meaning Ibn Umar, he should know because he was with him when he made all his Umrahs. So he made a mistake when he said this month. But she didn't come and she didn't belittle him, she didn't talk bad about him because he made this mistake. She, re she rectified his mistake and she made dua for him. And this is how we should be. When someone comes to us, our brother made a mistake, he says something wrong, may Allah forgive him what he said. He doesn't know what he's talking about, doesn't have knowledge. What is this these days? You, you, you might hear a lot of things people say to put someone down or to talk bad about someone that they made a mistake, but she said, may Allah forgive Abu Abdurrahman. And she said, he should know better because he was with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he made Umrah. And even Omar hearing this, he didn't affirm or deny, but he kept quiet because he realized, obviously, that this was the correct thing, that he didn't make Umrah during Rajab, uh, salatu uh, As we end, we reached, we said, we're going to go more than 35 minutes, but I'll just take a few more minutes to finish, inshallah ta'ala. Her role in the Ummah, after the death of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she became one of the main scholars, one of the main teachers, one of the main muftis, one of the main resources of this ummah that people will go back to to take knowledge. And this in itself is a lesson of the status and the role of women in Islam. When the women didn't have any rights in the West, who now they're constantly attacking us about women's rights and giving women their rights, and she wears hijab and she wears this. Aisha radiallahu anha didn't used to just cover her face with her niqab. She would teach the people how? Behind a curtain. Wouldn't even sit with them with her niqab and from behind the curtain she would teach them. But yet look at the knowledge that she taught the people and look how it spread. And we're sitting here 1400 years later talking about her knowledge and, and sharing her knowledge. And how many times when we get on this minbar for Juma and we say that Aisha radiallahu anha reported that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said this. Allahu Akbar. And she used to teach in her hijab, in, in fact behind a screen where people couldn't even see her, but she relayed the knowledge. She had a status. The status of a mufti is like the status of a wazir, of a minister. In many countries, and even many Muslim countries, the mufti has the same rank, the same status in the government, the government status, as the wazir, as the minister, the same way. This was her level. When women had no rights whatsoever, they couldn't be educated until when? In the 1800s or 1900s, when they started to get their rights to be educated in the West. And here we have someone who's one of the major scholars, major muftis, had a major position. She even took part in some political roles. She took a part in some in politics as well. When she, at the time of the death of Uthman radiallahu an, uh, when she felt what her opinion was, was the correct opinion, she stated it, she made it clear. Obviously when fitna happened between the Sahab after that, she pulled back from politics and she focused on her teaching. She focused on her teaching and, and, and benefiting the ummah what she could. She started to refrain from politics. However, if she was asked, if she was asked about politics or something or her opinion, she would state her opinion. One time, Mu'awi radiallahu anha, uh, radiallahu anhu, wrote a letter to her radiallahu anha, asking her, and we'll end with this inshallah ta'ala, he said, advise me and do not overburden me. This, this khitab, it comes from the khalifa of the Muslims, to Aisha radiallahu anha, and he's saying to her, advise me and don't overburden me. Don't give me too much. Give me something mukhtasir mufid, something that's brief, but it's beneficial, that I'll benefit from. And this shows you obviously the status of Mu'awiyah radiallahu anha. 
The enemies of Islam, Islam talk about him in a negative way. One of the great Sahaba of the, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, here he's, he's asking for advice from the other Sahaba. Ben, benefit me, advise me. And this is how we should be as Muslims as well. Especially if we reach a, 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 a status of position. We should go to those of knowledge. We should go to those who can benefit us and say, advise me, let me benefit. He said, advise her, don't overburden me. I don't want a, 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 an entire volume, something too long. Just give me something brief and beneficial. So he, she said to him, Assalamu alaikum, amma ba'd, to proceed. She said, indeed, I heard the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, whoever seeks Allah's pleasure, whoever seeks Allah's pleasure, even if it displeases the people, then Allah will suffice him from the people. Pay attention, ikhwan. That whoever seeks Allah's pleasure, even if, even if it displeases the people, then Allah will suffice him when it comes to the people. Allah will be with him. Allah will assist him. Allah will help him. He's not going to have any problem from the people. And then she said, and whoever, the Prophet said in the hadith, he said, and whoever seeks the people's pleasure, and whoever seeks the people's pleasure, and that which is displeasing to Allah, Allah will entrust him to the people. Allah is going to make it difficult, to you, difficult for you dealing with the people. Allah will make it difficult. And then she said it then, wassalamu alaikum. Very brief, very concise. Focus, because now you're the Khalifa, ya Muawiyah. Remember this hadith, that the main thing that you strive for as a Muslim, especially if you have authority, is Allah, the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why I always remind myself and the brothers, is that we say, what do we want in the hereafter? What is our objective when we come and we stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Several of us are what? In a hurry. We say Jannah right away. Say, shui, shui, inshallah. We'll, we'll get to Jannah, inshallah. We'll get there. Some say that Allah forgives us, alhamdulillah. And then in Jannah, we say, this is beautiful. But even better than that, we say, Allah, that Allah is pleased with us. This is the main thing that we want. That when we come and we stand in front of Allah, we're judged by Allah, Allah is pleased with us. And then that He forgives us. And then that we enter into the Jannah, inshallah ta'ala. This is our objective. This is what we want it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then obviously that we're blessed to be from those who see the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hereafter, which is the greatest blessing of the people of Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all from them, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And Allah knows best. Allahu alam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka wa Muhammad. And just forgive me, I went a bit over, inshallah, what I said I wanted to, but hopefully, inshallah, it was beneficial. Jazakum uh, Allah. Aisha radiallahu anha, just to mention her death, inshallah, as a, a thing of benefit. She died, radiallahu anha, during the Khilafah of Muawiyah, uh, the 17th of Ramadan, the 58th year of Hijrah, at the age of 66. She became sick, and she knew it was the end. She knew it was the end of her death, radiallahu anha. So she made an her wasiya that no one lead the prayer upon her, no one leads the janazah, except for Abu Huraira, radiallahu an. So when she died, Abu Huraira, radiallahu an, was the one who led the janazah, and she was buried in al-Baqi' radiallahu ta'ala anha. At the age of 66, the 58th year of Hijrah during the Khilafah of Mu'awi radiallahu anhu, the 17th of Ramadan.